folks, I'm Bill. Welcome to All Minus One Storytime, the segment where we read important historical stories, books about great ideas and what's going on in the world today. I'm glad that you all are here to join me. Today we're going to talk about COVID-19 and the Great Reset. So I hope you all are ready for this great and fantastic story. It says, about COVID-19, the Great Reset, since it made its entry on the world stage, it has dramatically torn up the existing script of how to govern countries, live with others, and take part in global economy. Written by World Economic Forum founder Klaus Schwab and monthly barometer author Theory Mellorant. COVID-19, the Great Reset, considers its far-reaching and dynamic or dramatic implications on tomorrow's world. The book's main objective is to help understand what's coming in a multitude of dominions. Published on July 2020, in the midst of the crisis, when further waves of infection may still arise, it is a hybrid between a contemporary essay and an academic snapshot of a critical moment in history. It includes theory and practice. Examples is chiefly exemplatory, containing many conjectures and ideas about what the post-pandemic world might and perhaps should look like. The book has three main chapters, offering a panoramic view of the future landscape. The first assesses what the impact of the pandemic will be on five key macro categories, the economy, the sociological, the geopolitical, the environmental, the technological factors. The second considers the effects in micro terms on specific industries and companies. The third hypothesizes about the nature of the possible consequence at the individual level. In early 2020, we are at a crossroads. The author argues, one path will take us to a better world, more inclusive, more equitable, and more respectful of mother nature. The other will take us to a world that resembles the one we just left behind, but worse and constantly dogged by nasty surprise. We must therefore get it right. The looming challenges could be more consequential than we have until now chosen to imagine, but our capacity to reset could also be greater than we have previously previously dared to hope. <clears throat> All right, that's enough of that. <laughs> uh, hey guys, this is a new segment I'm going to be doing. I will be reading from books. Uh, today is the uh, the first episode I'm going to do of this segment. Uh, by the way, I hit 100 subs yesterday, 101 actually, after making friends with uh, Jeremy and Delaney over at the... Um, um, weekly narrative. Um, they have a very good show. They will be uh, live Saturday evening. They go live Saturdays and Tuesdays. Um, speaking of live shows, I have a live show uh, myself called The Ends Justify the Memes. If you aren't aware, this Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern, that is January 1st, the 20, or sorry, January the 23rd, I'm thinking 123. <laughs> January the 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern, we'll have Rebecca from Beauty and the Bana and uh, her own private channel, Blonde and the Belly of the Beast. And if you don't know Rebecca, she's a kind of uh, spicy young lass, uh, now a mother, happily married, all that good stuff. And uh, she's got some interesting takes on the world. And so I just wanted to uh, interview her because I've known her for a couple of years and um why not? Why not have candid conversations and talk about things and our concerns in the world today? 
So with that, let's continue with what I have here. And today we're going to try and keep this, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 minutes long. So we'll get through what we can get through. This is the uh, about the author's section. It says, Professor Klaus Schwab in 1983, Ravensburg, Germany, I guess that's when he was born, is the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. In 1971, he published the Modern Enterprise Management in Mechanical Engineering. He argued in his book that the company must serve... Whoa. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> the, the company must serve not only shareholders, but all stakeholders to achieve long-term growth and prosperity. The reality of this, folks, is that the stakeholders are really the only the people that have power. They don't care. Uh, I read to you in that introduction there that they're worried about the environment, right? Equity and inclusiveness and Mother Earth. Yeah, um, I can also read to you from eugenicists from the early parts of the 20th century and what they had to say about how they didn't think certain people should be able to breed and whatnot. They thought in Malthusian terms that there won't be some sort of natural technological evolution, but there will be uh, overpopulation and therefore all of the world's resources will be devoured. And this is just silliness. The earth has a ton of land and resources. Of course, there, will, there may be a time in the future where that may be true, but I don't think it's true anytime soon within our lifetimes or my children's or grandchildren's or even great grandchildren's. Uh, they've been calling for this stuff for a long time and it hasn't happened in over 2000 years. So let's continue. It says to promote the stakeholder concept he founded the World Economic Forum the same year. It says Professor Schwab holds doctorates in economics, University of Freiburg, and engineering, a Swiss federal institution of technology, and attained a master's in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. In 1972, in addition to his leadership role at the forum, he became a professor at the University of Geneva. He has since received numerous international and national honors, including 17 honorary doctorates. His latest books are The Fourth Industrial Revolution, which I will probably cover here in a few weeks. I'll be doing these in segments. I will probably cover a couple different books at a time, and it'll be like part one of this book, part two, part three. Uh, I'm still going to do my regular content. I will still do quick shots, although I haven't done a quick shot all week, because... There's nothing to talk about in the news, folks. I mean, what happened happened, and it's exactly what I expected. Um, by the way, if you didn't know that, uh, you know, Antifa uh, rioted last night, you know, yet the uh, the Trumpsters are the ones who be who are being persecuted right now by the government, including the FBI investigating Parler, which is absolutely absurd. But in any case, I digress. Let's continue with the book, the world bestseller translated into 30 language and shaping the future of the fourth industrial revolution <clears throat> and then we have um theory malaret i guess he was born in 1961 in paris france is a managing partner in the monthly barometer a succinct predictive and um an analyst providing a private investor global ceo and option or sorry opinion and decision makers his professional experience includes funding the global risk or founding the global risk network at the world economic forum and heading its program team and it goes on about his education i don't really care not that big of a deal this is uh more of what i want to look at here contents the macro reset the conceptual framework economic reset Growth and employment, fiscal and monetary policies, societal reset, geopolitical reset, environmental reset, technological reset, and then contact tracing, contact tracking, and surveillance. If you got the food, the coof, uh, they're going to trace and surveil you, folks. They're doing it right now just 
to uh, people who supported the president who just left office. We are truly entering a dystopia. And the next line here, of course, says the risk of dystopia. There is no risk. This is a guarantee of dystopia. Do you know how you guard against dystopia? You allow people to remain free, to have small governments, to associate freely with themselves, to speak freely. You do everything that is antithetical to authoritarianism. That's how you guard against dystopia. You allow people the right to uh, protect themselves, to self-defense, to make their own destiny within the world. Everything else is dystopia, and I will tell you why. It's because they control everything. They get to tell you how to think, so you're not actually a free agent. You're not a, of free thought or mind. They tell you what you can and cannot say, what to eat, how to dress, when to go to work, when to come home. Go read Yevgeny Samantian's book, We, please, because it is exactly that. And uh, it was written long before 1984. So it says micro reset, industry and business, micro trends, industry reset, individual reset, redefining our humaneness. Okay. And the subsection there is better angels in our nature or not moral choices, mental health and well-being, changing priorities. Now, I haven't read any of this book. I have read some excerpts. I've seen some stuff. Um, but I did pick this up the other day so that I could share it with you. And um, I, again, just want to go through the basic introduction here. And that'll be about it for today. So it says the worldwide crisis triggered by the pandemic has no parallel in modern history. We cannot be accused of hyperbole. Uh, actually, you can because your data is totally incorrect on this being some sort of ridiculous killer thing. SARS and MERS had a much higher lethality. This thing, not really so much. When we, we're not being um, hyperbolic, I guess is when what he meant to say, this is going to confuse me a lot because I'm dyslexic and the English does not flow well. When we say it is plunging our world in its entirety and each of us individually into the most challenging times we've faced in generations. No, I think the Great Reset and all of the economic lockdowns that our government mandated are doing that. I don't think that the the COOF is doing that by itself. I'm pretty certain that if this was really bad, like they like to claim. Everyone would know people who have died, numerous people who have died um, with it or because of it without any uh, other pre-existing conditions like lack of vitamin D, lack of uh, proper nutrition, diabetes, uh, heart disease, obesity, certain lung diseases. Obviously, if you are not in good health, you're more likely to catch bacterial pneumonia while having a cold or any sort of other virus. It is very common. Happened to my daughter a few years back. I think she was like 12 or so. And she had pneumonia for, uh, I don't know, I think a month. No, it cleared up. She got better. But it happens, folks. It happens. And it happens all the time. We don't count it because of common colds, we don't count those deaths because we call it pneumonia. The numbers are ticking exactly the same as they have in years prior. In fact, from what I saw, it was a little bit less for um, mortality rates. It's just a matter of how we are classifying deaths. It is our defining moment. We will be dealing with its fallouts for years, and many things will change forever. It is bringing economic distribution of momental proportions, creating a dangerous and volatile period on multiple fronts, politically, socially, geopolitically, rising deep concerns about the environment and also exceeding the reach, pernicious or otherwise, of technology in our lives. No industry or business will be spared from the impact of these changes. Millions of companies risk disappearing and many industries face an uncertain future. 
a few will thrive. The only industries that are facing uncertain futures are the ones that are being engineered out of existence. On an individual basis, for many, life as they've always known, it is unraveling at an alarming speed. Well, that's because you have your head in the sand, you don't pay attention, you're too comfortable, and you're weak. And I mean weak in all sorts of ways, physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally weak. Most of modern society is, at least in the first world. But deep existential crisis also favors introspection and can harbor the potential for transformation. The fault lines of the world, most notably social divides, lack of fairness, absence of cooperation, Failure of global governance and leadership now lie exposed as never before, and people feel the time for reinvention has come. A new world will emerge, and contours of which are for us to both imagine and to draw. So, excuse me. So here, most notably, social divides. There's always going to be social divides. It's part of our nature. It's part of hierarchy. Lack of fairness. Life is not fair, folks. I was born short. Not fair. I would love to be tall. Absence of cooperation. Failure of global governance. Hmm. I thought independence were sovereign. Our sovereign nations were independent, right? Independent sovereign nations are independent. They, what is this global governance stuff? Hmm. Now, if you watch me regularly, you probably know I talk about this quite a bit, about the idea that these the, the one world government will come. The mainstream and normies, if you will, will say that you are a conspiracy theorist. Yet I can read directly from the words of these people who believe this stuff, who have tremendous influence. So much influence that the Pope has endorsed it. Justin Trudeau has endorsed it. Boris Johnson has endorsed it. Joe Biden had an entire campaign based on the concept of Build Back Better, which is straight out of the World Economic Forum. And you folks out there still believe that these are not puppets. The people who run things behind the scenes run the NGOs, they run the banks, and the leaders, the people you voted for, often, are at their whim. At the time of writing, in June 2020, the pandemic continues to worsen globally. Many of us are pondering when things will return to normal. The short response is never. Why never? Why never? There was an article out just the other day, folks, about what will happen after the vaccine. Oh, well, the coof will become just like a normal common cold because that's what it is. In fact, it's less severe than most common colds. The uh, WHO put out an advisory statement, I believe today. I might be wrong about that. But uh, they put out a statement saying that they don't want people to do PCR tests um, the way they've been doing them because with the PCR test, you're finding particulates of something and basically you can break down the uh, molecular structure of things to, to such an extreme level, the way these tests work, and you can find anything you want to find. And that's what they've been doing. That is in part, part of the high testing rate. So now that uh, old Joe Biden's in office, the WHO decided, well, we're going to change our stance on this and give you guidance and say, hey, spin these things up like 20 times, not 40. Nothing will ever return to the broken sense of normalcy that prevailed prior to the crisis because of the pandemic marks a fundamental inflection point in our global trajectory. Does it? Does it really? Only because you say so. It doesn't seem to be that way in any other case. Um, 
you know, I had a family member die with this thing, had pneumonia. I've known, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 people. I know a lot of people though, but I've known 20 or 30 people do maybe have this and every case they were fine. One of my wife's very good friends, uh, she had it. I think uh, someone was telling me their father, who is an older man, had it. Um, many people supposedly have had this. It's here to stay, folks. It's endemic. And this broken sense of normalcy prior to the crisis, what do you mean? The only broken sense of normalcy that existed was because of globalists like Klaus Schwab pulling strings behind the scenes, getting rid of actual uh, good sources of commodity standard money and printing money out of thin air using Keynesian economic models, manipulating markets. Broken sense, huh? Well, it wouldn't seem so broken if uh, we went and did things in an intelligent manner. The pandemic marks a fundamental inflection point in our global trajectory. Some analysts call it a major uh, bifurcation. Others refer to a deep crisis of biblical proportion. But the essence remains the same. The world as we know it in the early months of 2020 is no more dissolved in the context of the pandemic. Radical changes of such consequence are coming that some pundits have referred to before the coup and after the coup. This is just silliness. We will continue to be surprised by both the rapidity and unexpected nature of these changes as they conflate with each other. They will provoke second, third, fourth, and more order consequences. No, they will not. Second, third, fourth order consequences are a natural phenomenon of an action. What we are seeing is not anything of an action other than authoritarians saying, you must do these things. That is the next statement here, cascading effect of un unforeseen outcomes. No cascading effect. Not when governments say you're going to lock down, you're going to close your businesses, you can't do this, you can't do that. The only cascading effect that there is, is uh, caused by those in power. In so doing, they will shape a new normal, radically different from the one we will be progressively leaving behind. Many of our beliefs and assumptions about what the world could or should look like will be shattered in the process. Okay, buddy. However, broad and radical pronouncements like everything will change and an all or nothing black and white analysis should be deployed with great care. Of course, reality will be much more nuanced. By itself, the pandemic may not completely transform the world, but it is likely to accelerate many of the changes that were already taking place before it erupted. Let's take in that statement. Let's see. By itself... The pandemic may not completely transform the world, but it's likely to accelerate many of the changes already taking place before. Now, you can go to their website. You can see statements he's made. You can look at uh, their meeting in Davos this past year. He said specifically, we have to take this opportunity. Recall, the left always has a say, never let a good crisis go to waste. Which will in turn set in motion other changes. The only certain certainty, the changes won't be linear and sharp uh, discontinuities will prevail. So he's saying there won't be a linear rise. There'll be sharp discontinu discontinuities. They will prevail, is what he's saying. This is going to happen very fast, overnight. Your life will be changed. The world monetary system will change. It's coming, folks. It's coming. The Great Reset is an attempt to identify and shed light on the changes ahead and...
to make a modest contribution in terms of delineating what their more desirable and sustainable form might resemble. No, actually, what uh, you're looking at here is uh, not shedding light on anything other than the plans they already have for you. That's the reality of it. Let's begin by putting things into perspective. Human beings have been around for nearly 200,000 years. The oldest bacteria for billions of years and viruses for at least 300 million. This means that most likely... Pandemics have always existed and been an integral part of human history since people started traveling around. What do you mean most likely? We have historical records of pandemics. Um, we have historical records of plagues. There is no most likely. There's no speculation here. Over the past 2,000 years, they have been the rule, not the exception. Because of their inherently disrupted nature, epidemics throughout history have proven to be a force for lasting and often radical change, sparking riots, causing population classes, uh, clashes and military defeats, but also triggering innovations, redrawing national boundaries, and often paving the way for revolutions. Now, this is another very important sentence. He's excusing the riots here currently by saying historically. Okay, well... Maybe. Maybe this happened at certain times or another. Usually people would riot back in the day. They would rise up with pitchforks, as it were. They would do such a thing because of the king or the sheriff or whomever not taking care of them well. This was completely manufactured by media outrage. It was completely manufactured by locking people in when they didn't need to be. And by frustrating people by taking away their jobs. Causing population clashes and military defeats. Well, no. No, population clash clashes happen when one population, when one tribe, ethnicity, comes and meets another. And we know whoever has the most advanced technology tends to win. And uh, if technology is similar or there's a slight disparity, it is those who are better trained. Same with the uh, military defeats, but also triggering innovations. Yes, naturally triggering innovations, naturally, like they, they develop on their own, not forced by some sort of giant central oligarch behind the scenes. Redrawing national borders and often paving the way for revolutions. Okay. And this is a hint at, of course, getting rid of the current nation states that we have. Oh, excuse me there. Outbreaks forced empires to change courses, like the Byzantine Empire, when struck by the plague of Justinian. Uh, but the Byzantine Empire existed uh, with less power, don't get me wrong, up until essentially the 1400s. So what are you talking about? It was Islam that was the final blow to uh, Byzantium. And some even disappear altogether. When Aztecs and Inca emperors died, with most of their subjects from European germs, also authoritative measures to attempt to contain them have always been a part of the policy. Yeah, go away. Whoa. Okay, here. Sorry about that, guys. Back here where we were. Also, authoritative measures to attempt to contain them have always been part of the policy arsenal. So here he's excuse, excusing authoritarianism. Right? He's not just pointing to something that happened. He's saying, oh, yeah, authoritarianism has always rose up. Therefore, it's okay that we do it now. Might makes right to these folks. There's no guiding principle other than that. It goes back to the um, teachings of Aurister Crawley, the great Satanist, who said, the law is do with thy wilt, and that is all of the law. Meaning, do whatever you please to do. 
And uh, Nietzsche spoke on this as well in his master slave morality, saying that the masters will do as they please, essentially. Thus, there is nothing new about the confinement and lockdowns imposed upon much of the world to manage the coof. Amazing. Didn't even read ahead, and I predicted that. I knew exactly what he was talking about. They have been common practice for centuries. Just because we did something for centuries doesn't mean it's right. Just because something's new doesn't mean it's right either. We need to measure the efficacy of what we do. And the efficacy tells us, as I read to you a few days ago, that lockdowns don't work. They don't do anything. And Sweden isn't the only place that didn't lock down, folks. I just watched UFC fights yesterday in the UAE. Not locked down. They had live attendance there. Not a lot, but still. The earliest forms of confinement came with the quarantines instituted in an effort to contain the Black Death between 1347 and 1351. Killed about a third of all Europeans. That's right. Decimated the population. A third. Meaning, one, two, three. One of those is gone. Three people live in my home. One person in my home would have died from this. Do you know anyone who's passed from the coof or with the coof? Coming from the word uh, cortana, which means fortify in Italian, the idea of confining people for 40 days originated without the authorities really understanding what they wanted to contain. But the measures were one of the first forms of institutionalized public health. So what? Precedence of the past does not justify the future. That's, you know, when Stalin and Mao starved out millions of people, does that say it's okay to starve them out now? No. No, not at all. The idea of confining people for 40 days originated without the authorities really understanding what they wanted uh, to contain, but the measures were one of the first and most foremost institutionalized public health that helped legitimize the acceleration of power by the modern state. You'll see this a lot in his writings. The power of the state. This is exactly what fascism teaches folks, that the state is above all else and that humankind does not even exist outside of the state. No man, no singular entity matters outside of the state. The period of 40 days has no medical foundation. It was chosen for symbolic and religious reasons. Both the Old and New Testaments often refer to number 40 in the context of purification, in particular the 40 days of Lent and the 40 days of the Genesis flood. The spread of infectious disease has a unique ability to fuel fear, anxiety, and mass hysteria. Well, yeah, when you, when you put propaganda beside it, no one would even care if the news media wasn't out there and the governments weren't locking everything down. People would not care. It would just be, uh, oh, I got pneumonia this year and I, and I uh, was in the hospital. Or this dude got pneumonia and died. That's what it would have been. <coughs> in so doing, as we have seen, it also challenges our social cohesion and collective capacity to manage a crisis. Epidemics are by nature divisive and traumatizing. What we are fighting against is invisible. There's nothing traumatizing about this unless you have your head in the sand and you, you aren't prepared. That's actually one of the things that will give you PTSD is your naive, naivety. Be naive means you are unprepared mentally and emotionally to face a certain challenge. Sometimes it can be looking at your own evil. Sometimes it can be seeing the evil of others. But it has more to do with your comfort and your weakness, the weakness of your very soul, than anything. And that's why you become traumatized. What we are fighting against is invisible. Our families, friends, and neighbors may all become sources of infection. They're the bad guys. Those everyday rituals that we cherish, like meeting a friend in public place, may become a vehicle for transmission, and the authorities that try to keep us safe by enforcing confinement measures are often perceived as agents of oppression. Because they, ha because they are. They just are. Throughout history, the important and reoccurring pattern has been to search 
for scapegoats and place the blame firmly on the outsider. Uh, outsider. And this gets into the racial justice stuff. We will stop here, though, folks, because uh, I've gone for about 35 minutes. I hope you have enjoyed this. We will come back. I will read more of this. This is just the introduction. We will get into the other chapters. This is not a dense read from what I understand. But I want you to know this information. I want you to have it. And uh, hey, hey, this has been uh, All Minus One Storytime with Bill. I hope you enjoyed. Please like share and subscribe.